Got it. That's cool. Are they? So, Cena is here, Kayon. We're waiting for a few others. So, how many of you guys have been to Tionic? Not me. We are coming next week, next Thursday. Oh. No, no, no one yet. Uh, oh, yeah. Everyone, uh, everyone except me uh, will be taking off this next Thursday and we'll be in Tyanek uh, Friday, Tyanek and uh, uh, Anchorage, Friday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Okay. And everybody comes back on Sunday. Great. Well, I'm jealous. Like I said, I've never been there. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, hope to get you there. we hope we hope to get you there to uh, join us. Uh, Georgina and I were talking that maybe we can get you all to come down in our July meeting. If we can get uh, Michael to do some of his fundraising magic. Uh, that he's he's not here. Is he is not hearing me talking. Uh, he's a, he's a magician sometimes with finding sources of funds. So we keep, keep him looking till July. So maybe you all can come down. Stacy, you seem to be frozen. Am I frozen on you guys' end? Um, no, you're fine. No. Yeah. You'd be just on your end, Richard. No. Yeah. Could be. Yeah. Everybody else, I'm moving. I'm alive. Everybody else is moving. Uh, Here, I'll turn my camera off. Yeah, I've got my. Uh, oh, there you are. Yeah, okay. <laughs> there you are. You're live. Okay. Um, I guess we can begin now and uh, let people do the, what they can. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. And let's go ahead and begin. Uh, there'll be a couple more joining, I'm sure, but let's, uh, let's yeah. begin. Sure. sure. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen. Um, sure. Um, just a note for the audience. Uh, if you have any questions, just raise your hand uh, during the lecture and we can unmute you and you can ask the questions. Yes. Yeah, please do. Feel free to ask questions. Just interrupt me throughout whenever there's any confusion or you want more information because I really don't know what kind of background you guys are bringing to this. So it's a very general presentation. OK, but everybody can see the screen. Yes. So I just wanted to like um, highlight some of the purposes. Very basic to just familiarize everybody with some best practices for tribal consultation and outreach and engagement with tribal communities, underserved communities, remote Alaskan communities, um, give an overview of an environmental justice community or a tribe's role in engagement and consultation, and then uh, an overview of these terms that you may have heard of, environmental justice and energy justice. Uh, just again, an overview. So I thought I would start with some kind of overarching themes is what I think of them like think things big things to think about when working with small communities and you know my experience is working in Alaska with remote communities but I think a lot of this is really relevant for working with many communities anywhere in in the US and around the world so community capacity the digital divide research fatigue some other things that are nice to know about then I'm going to go over uh, government to government consultation because I think it's kind of a good high level overview. Then we'll talk about community based participatory research, compensation for research participants, and the two EJs, environmental justice and energy justice. And then we'll go out with questions and discussion. So, first, just community capacity is just a really good thing to always keep in mind that, uh, especially the tribal governments, 
but the other entities in these small communities are extremely busy and uh, it's the term that they use a lot is we don't have the capacity to manage a lot of projects and research and bureaucracy and meetings. So like when you reach out to a community and you want to start working with them, one of the best things to do is to figure out which entity and individuals really have the capacity to work with you, how they can participate and then to figure out how they like to participate. Do they want to do it all over the phone? Do they want in person meetings? Do they uh, prefer to text? Uh, there's you know, it's all very dependent on the individual. Another piece of advice is to, whenever possible, try to work around their schedules. So find out when their standing meetings are and be added to the agenda for that meeting instead of trying to establish your own separate meeting. Um, another piece of advice, most communities in Alaska, you would, the best practice would be to avoid uh, peak subsistence periods. So actually going in summer is usually not ideal. The ideal time to go and really get time to talk and work with people is in the dead of winter when there's not a lot of hunting and fishing going on. Obviously, business goes on in the summer. You still have to do that. Um, but I'll also find out when there's any big standing community events and avoid those. In general, to take the burden of bureaucracy, any bureaucracy that goes on with research or projects on yourself, don't just assume that because a community has a tribal government, and a village corporation and a city government that they are going to be able to handle this bureaucracy. Some communities are really great with that, but there's often a lot of um, turnover in personnel. One thing to keep in mind is that most tribal governments have one paid employee, maybe two, and they are running a government. And so it's a lot of work. And so everything you add on to them is just a can be a bureaucratic burden. So plan to be flexible, plan extra time. There's often weather delays and emergencies that come up that delay. So it's always good to be flexible. I think you hear a lot these days, meet people where they're at. And I think that that needs to be interpreted in a really broad spectrum of where they're at, like not just physically. And I use this image here. Um, if you can see it, this for research fatigue, this is a map the university and there's a university in Texas that does this that maps all the National Science Foundation research projects that are going on and you can see there that Alaska is covered in red dots. So this is just to indicate how much research is actually going on in Alaska to describe what we call research fatigue. And so you have a lot of people in communities say things that they are overmet. There's way too many meetings. They're being studied to death. And they suffer from what I have learned is called a great new term for this called translation exhaustion. So just just to keep in mind, there's a lot of projects going on and communities are dealing with a lot of meetings and outsiders and research projects and to be sensitive of that. OK, any questions so far, you guys? I haven't seen any hands raised. Please feel free to just interrupt and ask questions at any time. Also to be aware of the digital divide. Uh, it is a huge issue in many or if not most areas of Alaska. I like the definition of the digital divide. Yes, it's the gap between those who have internet, but really this encompasses all the broader social inequalities associated with the digitized world. So whenever possible, it's best to make sure that participation does not rely on the internet or computer literacy. You will find that a lot of people are extremely adept with their cell phone uh, smartphones and social media is extremely prevalent. There's a lot of people in Alaska who skipped personal computers. So there are like elders for whom English is not their first language. They've never learned to use a computer. They're completely fluent on a cell phone. Uh, so it's just one thing to keep in mind. Always best practice is to send any materials beforehand. If you have printed out materials or summaries, make binders. You can sometimes fax those, sometimes email them, have them print, but sometimes you just have to mail them. Um, often you can bring your own projector and a screen or a sheet and then provide your summaries in plain English. You know, overviews or notification flyers, any kind of big picture overview of your project in plain English is always really welcome. I like this term a lot that Dr. Twyla Baker came up with. I think it's really relevant. Uh, she and a group of colleagues were trying to put a name to this 
overwhelming, exhausting experience they've all experienced where they start working with usually white Americans and they have to spend many, many hours explaining their entire context of er erasure as native people. So she came up, they came up with this term translation exhaustion. And I just think it's along with community capacity and the digital divide, I think it's a good thing to keep in mind that it goes along with doing your own homework and not asking people to um, explain their entire historical context or why things are the way they are. Um, in meetings in Alaska and uh, in, in general, what um, Native scholars and Native activists hear, and it's kind of de rigueur these days and, and certainly appropriate, is to start off with a land acknowledgement. And I have in the slide here put uh, an example that a lot of people here at the Cold Climate Housing Research Center use on their email. And uh, this is definitely at the beginning of a presentation or a meeting. It is definitely the best practice to find out whose land you're on, the name of the tribe, pronounce it correctly, um, and, and, and thank them or acknowledge them at the beginning of the meeting. A lot of meetings in Alaska, uh, you will have an invocation or a prayer at the beginning of the meeting. And it's really good to just put that on the agenda, anticipate it, schedule for it. At the beginning of the meeting, find out who wants to give that invocation. It's often the eldest person in the room. They will defer to the elder. They will often give the invocation in their native language. And then it's also really good to do really, you know, in-depth introductions and include everybody who's participating. And I wanted to include this thing about positionality statements. Positionality statements are something that people like to see usually in like a paper or a presentation. It's not just like who I am and where I'm from, but it's acknowledging that who I am and where I'm from and the context that I grew up in shapes how I see the world, right? And so you're just acknowledging that like, I have a limited worldview based on, you know, how I was raised, the fact that I'm a white, middle-class academic. I've tried to learn a lot in Alaska, you know. Um, so when introducing yourselves, give a little context of your worldview and, and how that's shaped you and your background. And you will notice in meetings with Alaskans, uh, they will often, you know, introduce themselves by their name, but also their parents and their grandparents and where they're from and their tribe, etc. So here, just quickly, this is a little dry, but I thought it would be good to give a quick explanation of what government to government tribal consultation is. And because obviously Georgia Tech and Purdue are not the government, but I think it's good <clears throat> to understand what's actually required of the federal government as sort of a bar, right? This is what um, the federal government is required to do when they're consulting with any tribe, government, to government, federal government to tribal government. This is separate just to clarify from Native American consultation. That's for uh, like archaeological uh, artifacts and cultural remains and stuff like that. This is just consultation with the tribe. So federally recognized tribes have a unique legal and political relationship with the United States as defined by the Constitution, treaties, statutes, court decisions and executive orders. Um, just a little bit more on the definition. We, federal agencies, and everybody should really follow these policies. You consult with tribes on any policy or any action that has an implication for the tribe. So whether it's legislation, building a house, doing anything on their land, anything that involves them, you at least offer them the chance to consult. And the best practice, no surprise, is to consult really early and really often. Uh, and this, in, you know, in Alaska with remote communities, uh, you definitely don't want to. Yep, there's a question. Go ahead, Ayushi. So I was wondering if there is a, if there is any particular method of consulting the this community, or uh, it is up to the organization how they want to proceed. Yeah, the best practice is all of the above. So you would start by uh, writing a letter that lays out exactly what is going to happen. Right, and giving people the opportunity to consult. We want to engage with you. We invite you. This is we've you know budgeted money for your participation, and you would mail that letter to all the entities 
you know, certainly the tribe, but good practices to include the other entities in a community and then follow up with an email and then follow up with a phone call and then, you know, arrange a conference call. So if you're going to do it like legally for the federal government, you have to send it certified mail, make sure that it got there. That's all required. Uh, but it's still the best practice for anybody who's doing this to start off with a formal letter and then follow up with all the sort of like more casual ways. Got it. That Thank you. Yeah. You bet. I have to get back to my screen. So ideally, the ideal of consultation is that anybody in the tribe who wants to be consulted is completely informed. So they're making informed decision making through meaningful consultation and collaboration. And so the federal government is 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 supposed to favor maximum participation of the tribes. So we're not just letting them know what's going on. We are facilitating their participation at every step. The bare minimum, right? is at least giving people adequate notification and many invitations to consult. They may not want to consult with you. They may not want to participate in your project, and that's absolutely their right. But you still have to make an effort to provide information to them in every accessible format. So flyers, radio, newspapers, etc. I mean, this is all you know contingent on like the scale of whatever research project or infrastructure project you're doing, but it's really a best practice. And here this is a little bit of an answer to your question, Ayushe. First, like determine if you know something you're doing is going to have an impact on people and then you notify them, send the letter and then follow up. And here I wanted to switch to a term that's used really for a lot of research projects that are conducted with communities, collaborative community based participatory research or CBPR. And that is merely a research or projects that are based on equal partnerships between all parties. And I sort of this is really my high level like ideas of the main themes here. Permission and consent is something you will hear a lot. So like generally saying like we're coming to do this research project is definitely not enough. You want to get consent from the tribe. I actually think it's great, great to get consent from the tribe, not just in consent, informed consent. Explain to them what you're doing, get their blessing. But in Alaska, it's complicated because you probably also want to get it from the city and the at least the village corporation. And this CBPR is really based on reciprocity. And so the idea is like, OK, well, I have this research project I want to do with community. What am I going to get out of that? You know, I may publish papers and eventually get an academic degree that will enable me to get a let like a fancy career out of this project. Is what this community is getting. Of equal value. So the goal is to make sure that whatever the community and the participants are getting out of this is equivalent in value to what you're doing. So it's not just extractive. You're not just benefiting from your research at their expense. Respect. I mean, I could have like listed a lot of things there. You want to respect everybody's time, obviously their culture, their language, the land, climate, and people's frustrations with how this has gone in the past. So a lot of work in Alaska, depending on what you're doing, a lot of people will just need to vent about how poorly things have gone in the past. And I really think it's just incumbent on us to take the time to listen to them and, and respect everything they have to say, whether or not it's relevant to your project. So listen to them. Uh, it's uh, oral historians who have worked a lot in Alaska have described this phenomena where like Alaska natives, you ask them a straightforward question and they do not give you a straightforward answer. They respond with a story that has seemingly nothing to do with your question. But that is a really traditional form of communicating um, for Alaska natives, storytelling, also lots of long pauses, especially um, a lot of people here, here are not like white Americans, but a white Americans tend to get very uncomfortable with long periods of nobody talking and they like to fill it with language. Uh, but for Alaska natives, that's that's commonly not not the case. No need to fill in empty spaces, just wait for people to respond. 
and then time and trust and just spend plenty of time doing your homework to show respect. So, you know, as much research as you can do on Tyonic and the people there before you go would be great um, because then you're not leaving it to them to explain it. And I think, oh, so here I was just showing some slides of other things that you can do, like best practices, is when you're setting up engagement, workshops, meetings, presentations, whatever, you can really do a lot with just seating arrangements. Um, in the upper right, you see, uh, this was not for CCHRC, this is my previous work. I really like to reserve community centers, or in this case, it's the North Slope Borough Assembly Chambers, and put the tribal representatives in the position of power to show respect, to make it very clear these are the traditional knowledge holders. The people who are visiting are coming to present to them and get their input. So you can do a lot from that. You can always, if you have everybody's name who's going to be there, you can make um, place names for them. Uh, I also think it's a really good practice to record every meeting, like record the audio at the very least and also take notes and make sure that you're getting everybody's name correctly it just shows like a lot of respect to make it very obvious that you're listening carefully to every individual you want to know their name and what they're saying and get it all right there's a lot of complicated place names and stuff like that um, so that's just another best practice and sometimes you can see in some places you're just meeting in small community centers you know, it's not as easy, but you do what you can. You know, a circle is always better than like everybody sitting in rows, uh, U-shaped seating arrangements, stuff like that. Then I just wanted to, uh, there was this great native talking circle on community-based participatory research at the Alaska Anthropological Association Conference in 2021. It was a wonderful gathering of a bunch of native elders and native students and um, community leaders, and they were asked to give their advice on how to conduct respectful, effective, collaborative research. And so they went around the talking circle and everybody gave their advice. And I sort of summarized some of the main themes here, which reflect back to my previous slide. A lot of them said this, please do your homework first, give as much notice as possible. Now in there, Native scholars were saying, I told my community three years in advance. This is not always feasible, but as much advance notice as you could possibly give give is, is best. Um, you will hear in Alaska a lot, and I think with infrastructure and housing projects, this is not really a problem, uh, but what you really want to do is let the research or projects be identified by the community. Ideally, you don't come up with a research project or an infrastructure project or a building project and go to the community and tell them you want to do it. You want to work with the community and see what they want. Take as much time as needed, work according to their schedules, budget money to pay local people, pay for you know, a high level summary to be translated into the local language, pay for translators at your meetings, even if everybody in the meeting is actually fluent in English and can understand you, people really appreciate it hearing it also presented in their native language. So if that's an option where you're working, I really recommend it. Always give them any reports or findings first and allow them to review it. Uh, this is a quote from scholar Judith Ramos when working with indigenous people. It is all about their relationship to the land, place, and each other as clan members. It kind of relates to the earlier slide when I said respect the land. A really common problem in Alaska is outsiders come and they tend to make a bunch of comments about, wow, it's so cold and so barren and I don't understand how people live here. It seems impossible. And those kinds of comments can be interpreted as very insulting to people who do live here and have lived here for thousands and tens of thousands of years very successfully, especially because they are so closely identified with the land. So respect the land don't make any denigrating comments about how cold and dark or whatever it is. Partner with the whole community was their other advice. Um, and also mistakes are part of the journey. And that's a huge one. Like you, I just don't think it's really possible to go do work in, in, in like remote native Alaska and not just 
basically sort of, you know, bumble through it and, and make mistakes and insult people and just you should accept that that's going to happen and just keep trying and do your best and always give back and establish long term reciprocal relationships. You will hear a lot that people, you know, the first time you come to a community, they're like, yeah, whatever. But if you come back, they are very much like, oh, this person not only came here, but came back. And that shows a lot of commitment to the project and people really appreciate that. Any questions so far? Anybody? We're good. So I wanted to show that the, the uh, Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee, IARPIC, has um, updated their principles for conducting research in the Arctic, and they really reflect all the things that, you know, the native elders and scholars said at this uh, talking circle, which was be accountable, establish effective communication, respect indigenous knowledge and cultures, build and sustain relationships, and pursue, pursue responsible environmental stewardship. And so there's a link there. You can also find those online with a lot more details on how to do that. And that really is just a great summary of conducting research in the Arctic that should um, should be like boilerplate for whatever we're doing. And then I just wanted to share that there's a lot of research that's gone into how to conduct community based participatory research with models and graphics. I'm not going to like spend any time on the slide. Just wanted to indicate that a lot of these things play into it. And then I'm going to move on to <clears throat> best practices for compensation. I feel really strongly about this. It's a, one of my main things that I'm always uh, trying to convince people to do is to budget a lot of money in your research projects to compensate people for their time. It's a sore point for Alaska Natives. You can imagine that there's a long history of Native populations being asked to contribute their time and their traditional knowledge um, and expertise to studies without having any benefit. And, and and actually these meetings and research, you know, they've they've resulted in some bitterness at the very least, or or even intergenerational trauma. And so it will be very difficult. You know, maybe if you're building a house, that's one thing, but a lot of projects, it's not really obvious what benefit a community is going to get from your research, right? And so compensating them for their time and participation means they will get at least one tangible benefit. Now, some people say like this just makes it seem very transactional and cold and people are uh, very warm and 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 going to be very welcoming, but I, I don't think anybody would turn down payment for their participation. So we have standard rates that we usually pay people for interviews or um, attending meetings. Um, and it is tough because the cost of living in Alaska is much higher than in most of the lower 48 and so the rates seem surprising to people from the lower 48 i personally will not interview anybody for really less than like a hundred dollars and so um, yep definitely budget for that and working through the bureaucracy of paying people can be very challenging but it's it's super important so when you are engaging and you're in the field or in a community and you're having workshops or presentations or meetings, in addition to paying people, it's absolutely culturally imperative to provide food and drinks at the meeting. Um, really nice if you can provide like games or coloring books or childcare for the kids so people can bring their kids. You know, maybe in a, in a small village, transportation is not always that important, but actually in the winter in a village, people do need rides. And so helping organize that Another thing you can do is a lot of um, communities, uh, they've moved a lot to Facebook, but a lot of communities still like operate over VHF radio. Everybody's got their VHF radio on, so you can announce who you are when you get to town on that radio and then invite everybody to the meeting and, you know, use the radio again to invite everybody and let them know there's snacks or dinner or whatever it is. If you can have raffles and door prizes or any way that you can make your meeting or presentation fun, uh, that goes a long way. I should have added humor throughout all of this is highly appreciated. So anytime you can make it fun and humorous. And I just wanted to point out that this is true everywhere, but um, participation in, in like research projects or public meetings, even when 100% of the participants are members of the ethnic group, 
are not necessarily re representative of the population. And this is, uh, I think you can understand this, that there's a subset of people who are politically active who tend to participate more. And so they are disproportionately represented. And people who are older and have lived somewhere longer and are higher income are more likely to participate. And this is actually especially true with housing projects, at least in the lower 48. It, that's probably different in Alaska. And then in Alaska, depending on the region, there's all often cultural traditions that would inhibit somebody's participation. I mean, there's economic and political and social reasons that people not, might not participate, but there's also just cultural reasons. People like to avoid conflict, so if there's anything about your project that might have conflict, people might not want to talk about that publicly. And in general, um, uh, people do not contradict elders. Uh, respecting your elders is, I would say, like pretty much a blanket cultural norm in Alaska. Go ahead, Ayushi. Um, well, I was just wondering if there is any way of uh, including different genders in this process and how to focus on them because, you know, we are discussing community and their needs, so different genders might have different views. Absolutely. And I think Aaron has discussed this too. I don't know if he talked about it yesterday, but I think when CCHRC does charrettes in communities, it's a really good practice to try and set up a workshop with just the women. You know, you can talk to just the children and just the young people, but any opportunity you can get to um, have people participating in a form where they don't have to contradict an elder or a man and get feedback where people are comfortable from different groups. Good plan. Does that, does that answer your question? Yes, yes, of course. Thank you. Yes. So moving on to these like sort of big themes that I think people are, are probably hearing a lot these these days. Um, uh, the, all relevant actually for any research in Alaska or any projects or infrastructure. Um, and one that you may have heard of is environmental justice. And this definition is important. I think it's good to just run over that's the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respect to basically anything that happens, right? Now, the classic example of environmental justice or injustice, right? And when we think about it in the United States, it's often like polluting industries tend to be built near minority communities. So poor communities end up with a disproportionate burden of pollution. But it is much more than that. It's not just the physical environment. But that's sort of the um, classic example of highways or dumps or power plants being located next to low income communities. And that's basically that is an environmental injustice. Poor or minority or tribal people, tribal people are automatically considered an environmental justice population, uh, should not bear disproportionate impacts from anything that happens. So the fair treatment no specific group of people should bear a disproportionate share of any adverse environmental consequences. And then meaningful involvement, entities should facilitate the participation of potentially affected environmental justice populations. Right, any questions about that before I move on? Okay, so then another term that is really getting a lot of traction, especially with the Biden administration, is energy justice. It's unfortunate they have the same acronyms. So when people say EJ, don't know, they're talking about environmental justice or energy justice. They are certainly connected. Energy justice is also connected to climate justice or energy democracy and racial justice. And I think a lot of people can understand what energy injustice involves the negative health effects of not having access to adequate energy systems or what's called the energy burden. So poor people spend a disproportionately high percentage of their income on energy. Uh, and energy poverty and limited or no access to modern forms of energy 
and unreliable energy, intermittent energy. It includes unequal opportunity for employment in clean energy spaces and limited or no benefit from energy efficiency or clean energy programs. And I have a couple more slides on energy justice. I do think it's a super important topic and I don't know if anybody's heard about what's it called EJ40 or Justice 40 initiative. The Biden administration has required that 40% of all federal monies that are going towards energy in the country under his administration, 40% of that has to be dedicated to basically addressing energy justice to make sure that it's not that the benefits of any new clean energy are going proportionally to environmental justice populations, to poor minority and tribal people. Um, so energy justice, there's a couple definitions. You could say that it's a global energy system that fairly disseminates both the benefits and costs of energy services and one that contributes to more representative and impartial decision making. But here you can also see that people have like framed it within a right, like a, a framework of human rights, that energy is so fundamental to success and livelihood that it can be considered a fundamental human right. So people have the right to a healthy, sustainable energy production and the best available energy infrastructure and affordable energy and uninterrupted service. So that's a big uh, step in, in thinking about that. I appreciate. And then taking it even further, the goal of achieving equity in both the social and economic participation in the energy system, while also remediating social, economic and health burdens on those historically harmed by energy systems. So you can see there that that definition is not just uh, equality, but true equity like actually making sure that people who have been historically harmed are brought up to the same level. So that's the goal of energy justice. And let's see, I'm not sure. I'll, I didn't mean to end so quickly, but I'm glad that I got through that as quickly as I did. And I really hope that you have more questions. I did not know what your backgrounds were. And so what might be what might you might be most curious about? for best practices with engaging with communities? Well, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Fritz. Uh, this lecture made us really understand the best practices possible for community engagement and how to, you know, uh, sensitively approach this entire process. So thank you very much for this. And uh, for the audience, uh, this was part of uh, the primer lecture series, and today was the second day of it. And uh, this was organized by IBEPSA Georgia Tech chapter with the Cold Climate Housing Research Center and National Renewable Energy Lab. So let us keep this open for questions, and uh, I'm sure there are questions coming our way. One thing I didn't yes. say. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, Stacy, when we are the first trip we're making uh, has to do primarily with listening. Uh, and the addition, uh, the objective is to listen and learn. Uh, the second one is to uh, participate. Uh, a charrette, maybe it's not a charrette, maybe it's interviews uh, and so on. Uh, the third one is to actually make a presentation of what we have done uh, that hopefully fits with everything and so on. So what kind of recommendations do you have or, or, or concerns, advice about that first meeting uh, where we will be, and I don't have the agenda, so we don't have the agenda set yet, but we'll be meeting with the uh, to who the foundation uh, will be meeting with the tribal council. Uh, we'll be meeting with the uh, uh, conservation district, tribal conservation district, uh, having dinner with them. Then we'll be having uh, uh, other time. We visit the site and I assume we'll be there with some local people. So 
what is your advice and sort of guesswork of how communication happens in those situations? Yeah, great question. And like, let me start off by saying I am not familiar with Tyonic. I have never been there. And one thing I really think is important to keep in mind is that people have a tendency to sort of um, like lump, uh, especially remote Alaska Native villages, like, oh, you know, work this way there. And so it might work this way there, you know, and, and every community is completely unique and has their own unique history. And, you know, who, which entities are really active can differ from place to place. So I cannot answer that with any great authority. I don't know anybody in Tyonic and I've never been there. Um, but I think it's very good that you are scheduled to sort of to meet with all these different entities separately. That seems better than like trying to have one big community meeting, although that's probably also a good idea. Um, I'm assuming that you've notified, sort of done public notice in Tyonic that you are coming. And that sort of yeah. goes a long way. Like when a plane load of white people show up or non-white, but foreigners or outsiders, if people have any notice that you're coming, it they're already warmer towards you. You know, the great thing about your project is that I think it's something that everybody supports, right? So it's not like you're going in there to propose some project that half the community is going to be opposed to right yeah. so that's great you have that on your side i would just say that you know if you can record people or and take really good notes um it's, you know you might not be prepared to do that like when you're on a site visit always good with people are handy with their cell phones to record people um and and ask individuals questions like i said you know like be aware that it you know the people you're meeting with may not be the people who end up living in the house so try to make sure that you're visiting with families who might actually be the occupants of the house yep so and then, so you think that record uh, uh audio recording and video recording during conversations uh in casual situations like the site visit, uh, talking to people. Uh... You know, one thing I did not include because it's a huge subject, this would be like, you know, an entire class is if you're actually going to record somebody, what you should have is an exemption from your institution's IRB Institutional Review Board for Human Subjects Research, but that's if you're going to take what they say and in any way use it. So ideally, if you know, that's when you would like give them a form to sign. I'm sure many of you have been interviewed and somebody gives you a form and they're like, do you want to be anonymous or what can we do with whatever you say? So that is something you should think about and talk to your IRB about you know, if we want to record people, can we use anything they say or what do we need to do? They might have you do an IRB exemption. If you did okay. that, you know, and I don't know what aspects of this project, you know, it, is it just a design or is there going to be some report on all the social interactions and traditional knowledge? If that is information that you want to use in your, you know, final product, best practice is definitely to get an official IRB exemption for human subject research. Right. So you just would say like, you know, and a lot of those limit you from talking to children or something like that, but it, that's the very official way to do it. And in that case, then people are informed. You don't necessarily have to have them sign the paper, say, hey, can I interview you? Like get them to know what they're agreeing gotcha. to and yeah. consent. Yeah. yeah. So asking the question first, but you think it's appropriate to do the interviews like that and do the filming uh, is something that's that there's some uh, boundary, some taboo that we should be very careful about. Just asking permission makes sense. I think it, you know, I can't speak for these entities that you're meeting with and and what kind of boundaries they might have. Just I would just say to to cover your bases, it would be good to do 
uh, a little uh, IRB review of the project first. So they will like ask you would like present you would have to submit to your university's IRB like these are the type of questions we would ask. These are the type of people we would ask. Here's what we will do with that data, how we will manage our data, where we will save these recordings, who will have them in perpetuity. You know, if, we're, if it's going to be anonymous and then, you know, every individual, some people don't want to be recorded. They don't want to be video recorded. They don't want you to take notes. Other people, you know, it's very individual. They like, please video record me. I don't like a lot of people think that like, you know, video, re video recording is the only way to go. Yeah. Right? And then, but most important, obviously, whatever you get from people before you share that with anybody, you protect that data. You anonymize that data if that's appropriate. And then before you do anything with it, you check with them. Like, here's the report that uses your information. Is this OK? Yeah, yeah, good. That's a good that's a good reminder. Yeah. What about participation in a charrette? And how a charrette might be conducted? That is, you talked about the setup in a room. Uh, you know, tables uh, carrying on discussions about different ideas about the community center proposal. For example, uh, we learned from Aaron last night that uh, the idea of having separate things like a separate bunkhouse and a separate community center and a separate garage may be not very smart in terms of sustainability and energy uses. But it could be very important for cultural reasons. So those questions are going to come up because those there's a lot of those, I think, uh, hovering around this project. Mm -hmm. So how do you advise addressing those questions? Uh, it's not something that you ask point blank and expect to get an answer that you say, oh, OK. So. What's your thoughts about how to go about a conversation about issues like that? And it would be same with housing when you're talking about the arrangement of an internal plan for a house. Same thing of different rooms versus same rooms, how rooms are connected and so on. So what's your. Help us out. Yeah, you know, and I think and this is generally like just meetings, like the study of meetings, you know, people process information and respond in different ways. And this is just my off the cuff thinking is that when you ask those sort of questions to people right on the spot, they might not have a response. They might want to think about it and hear what other people have to say. And then it could be even weeks later that they're like, oh, you know, now they have a really solid thought on that that they want to share. And, and those types of questions seem like pretty big ones. I kind of wonder like whether, you know, you're not going to ask somebody point blank, but you could have like a a kind of like list of like here's our top questions that we want people to think about through this process that we you know need feedback on and 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 distribute that to people so that and encourage them to provide their input later they don't have to answer on the spot give them time to think about it mm -hmm. um, yeah and and definitely with charrettes i actually don't have a lot of experience with design charrettes because Pretty much the entire time I've been at CCHRC, we've been in a pandemic. So all my experience with meetings has not been like designing a house that people want, right? It has been around infrastructure and everything like that. Um, but so Aaron has more experience with that and he knows the exact same thing. You want to talk to the women separately. You want to give people plenty of different types of, uh, um, you know, models and prototypes like not just blueprints on a sprint on a screen. I really do think that there's probably a lot of um, benefits to be had from any kind of physical architectural models, pictures yeah. you could bring that people could look at to 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 sort of visualize a floor plan and, and flow in a house besides looking at blueprints. They're not obvious to people who are not architects. And it'd be good when you're letting people know that you're coming, you've let them know, you'd let them know you're going to be there to, to do this. 
to listen and learn first, and then you're going to come back and do the charrette, which is great, yep. and then come back and do a presentation. And it, it's going to be really helpful. I'm sure that the people you're working with directly know this, but just remind people like this is our first trip and then we'll be back. That'll be really helpful because they'll know then, oh, those people are coming back. When they do, I want to make sure I tell them, you know, this or this or that that I thought about in response to their questions. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes uh, in community work that we've done uh, in communities across Georgia, uh, and even uh, work uh, that we've done, studios that we've had in China, we do things like uh, bring uh, Georgia Tech gear, like T-shirts, uh, Georgia Tech hats. Is that appropriate? Yes. Uh, I, yeah. 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 Yeah, it, absolutely. it leaves a memory and it's fun. It's good for a laugh. Yeah. OK, yeah. so Purdue uh, listen to that. We've had uh, terrific responses before uh, of just uh, hats that say Georgia Tech, big GT on it. Uh, it's fun and it's uh, lively and they feel like they have something that's a uh, it's a memory of the of the event. Uh, what about payments for interviews? If we find somebody who's really you think knows a lot and is willing to talk uh and you could ask them then maybe if it's okay to talk to them afterwards uh, and then an honorarium which i've never done before but is that appropriate to do and, and in cash uh, Ideally cash. It's very complicated to get cash, but that is absolutely the best way to compensate somebody. You know, depending on your it's all dependent on your funding and your grant manager and whatever you're funding, uh, whoever's managing that. The best way to do it is to have cash, get a receipt and then get reimbursed through your funder. Now there's complicated. You can buy gift cards. You can give gift cards to like the tribe or the foundation and have them distribute them. Um, checks are not great, obviously. Uh, Amazon gift cards online, but that requires like people to like, you know, be online and accept it. Cash is definitely the best. And there's, yeah. you know, you can, writing checks, sometimes people can't, can't cash them. And so. Yeah, so cash, is, cash would be okay. And that's sort of informal. And how do you do that? How do you, do you pay before for you start an interview? Do you? Uh, it's no, a I, gift. It's not a business deal. It's a gift. So, I, uh, I I I consider it adequate compensation for their time and expertise. You know, look at the rate that professionals charge for their time and expertise, and it's just like that. It's just like a consultation. And so, uh, in Alaska, like I mentioned, it's the rates are higher than in in like the lower 48 because the cost of living is is so high so you do not want to pay too much right that's that that's considered like coercion right you don't want to offer somebody hundreds of dollars but a fair rate is really like at least fifty dollars yep fifty to a hundred dollars for an hour-long interview is pretty standard yep okay okay so that's good so then at the beginning say meet someone in a meeting and you see that they're really talking and they would be really valuable to hear more from. And you say, then, uh, could I talk to you afterward and I'll be happy to compensate you? Do you yeah. actually say that? Yep. Sure. Or right you, can just announce, yeah. you can just announce during the meeting. We're also looking to do, you know, longer form one on one interviews with people who are interested and have a lot to say about this. And we have, you know, budget to pay x number of people for those interviews and then you know the a good way to do that uh, is when you interview somebody and then at the end of the interview you always ask like who else in this community should we really be talking to you know and then do you think they would be willing to talk to us do you think we could schedule them for an interview you know to yeah. sort of build out and because right. You know, okay. in summer, especially a lot of people are not going to make it to the public meetings. They are going to, you know, that's the problem with doing all this in the summers. I'm assuming that not familiar with Tionic, but I'm assuming they're pretty busy in the summer. And so 
Yeah. Meet so you. the, the, the around head, there. yeah, Vida, Vi who's the head of the foundation, would be a person to ask to find out who the people are, and then she would end. So that would work out. Yeah. What I was worried about is just blindly talking to somebody and you know perceive the perception of slipping somebody cash and you know, the sort of weirdness that might. But I think working through a leader. Uh, or someone who knows other people and asking who to interview and explain, you know, that we're doing it to try to get information and uh, fairly compensated and so on. Yeah. Okay. Good. I mean, I, I'm assuming that, you know, there's some kind of funding agency that you're going to have to like, you know, justify your expenses for. And so ideally you would have them sign a receipt. Yeah. yeah. And we have to figure that out. Yeah. yeah. But I think you know you you it's not going to be awkward to pay people. It's um, absolutely understood as part of the deal. I don't think any it's part of the deal. Yeah. I, I mean, it's 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 pretty standard. And I'm you know even in Tyonic, I'm sure people people are used to you know getting compensated for interviews. And if you can't, you know, it might be a little weird to pay people. They probably don't need to be paid to come to your meetings. But those other parts of the meetings are absolutely, I would say, required. Like, and maybe you plan for this, and you're coming straight from Anchorage, so that's great. To bring food and refreshments, you know, to the meeting is is pretty minimum. That's that's what you want, and you'll get a lot more participation in your meeting the better food you have. So, right. you know, you can be really inventive and think of things that it's hard for them to get in the community, right? Like. Uh, pizzas, or I have done like 300 pieces of fried chicken from Fred Meyers, and then you heat that up in the community center in the oven, you will really warm people to your research project. All right, all right. Good, good. Yeah. So it's uh, it's similar to what we do with the uh, local communities in the south, but it's all, but it's also uh, their differences. And what I'm trying to do is tease out the differences, and a lot of that just has to do with the number of tribes and the research that's going on, which is hugely different. Because uh, in Georgia, where we go to smaller communities, or in the city of Atlanta, go to smaller communities. Uh, sometimes they've never talked to anybody uh, about any of these things, never a conversation. So there will be prior conversations about a lot of things that they know more about than we knew. We know about how they've been uh, participants before. Got it. I mean, <clears throat> like I said, I'm not familiar with Tyonic. I don't know what kind of research has gone on there. But as you saw the map, like there's, you know, with climate change and with requirements. So, uh, you know, the National Science Foundation especially requires any interdisciplinary or social science research project to include native partners. And so there's a lot of demand for native participation in all levels of research. Yep. And, and there's been a lot of, you know, not always positive feedback about that. Like I also said, they, they, there's been several native entities who've written and said, like, could you please study what we need, which is infrastructure? So working on housing, you've already eliminated, I think, a lot of the sort of traditional problems. Like this is not this is not some research project for your own benefit. This will result in housing or a community center for the community. So that part is really clear and that's great. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions? I'm all right. Well, you guys, I think everybody here has my email and please feel free to reach out. You know, before, like I said, my positionality, right? I am not a native Alaskan subjected to these outsiders coming to my village. I'm a white person raised in lore 48. I'm a colonial settler here in Alaska, so please don't take my word for it. I have 
studied this and participated in a lot of it. So um, I, I can give you, you know, this high level overview. I had sent a, like a Word document with a bunch, bunch of links for, I think, engaging with Alaska Natives or outreach or whatever. Some of those are really, really good and you'll get a lot more insights, I think, into cultural communication from those than from me. Yeah. OK, sure. I can forward that uh, document with everyone. It is. I have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Thank you. And I uh, hope to see you in uh, TNEC in uh, July. So actually one question, one quick question. I I think that it's pronounced Tyonic. I kind of looked this up. I'm like, are we all pronouncing Tyonic wrong? Uh, Good. So, <laughs> you need a lesson. OK, well, uh, as far as I can tell, it actually is Tyonic. And I don't know, maybe Aaron or, or Georgina knows what that actually means, what the word actually means. And that might help us figure out what the pronunciation is. Not a problem to ask anybody just to make sure that you're pronouncing it correctly. Yeah, because I noticed that I pronounce it in different ways, <laughs> depending on uh, how my head's connected to my mouth. Uh, uh, and I don't know. OK, hey, that's a good that's, I mean, uh, It's an easy uh, one, right? Everything. Ask. OK. Oh, good comment. They have the indigenous pronunciation. Aaron, do you know? I think I looked it up a while ago when I was like, have I been saying it wrong this whole time? Um, and I, I think I confirmed that it is pronounced Tyonic, but I'm not 100%. Tyonic, OK. Maybe we'll find it online with the uh, uh, some native speaker saying the word. Or Vida clearly knows, and she's our, yeah. uh, she's our prime contact. So yeah, we can then, ourselves. And then on my last slide, you know, I had like, thank you and Kainakpuk and that's a Nupiak and, you know, struggling through learning just a few words of the native language will go a long way. So I really encourage everybody to learn like at least thank you and hello, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, that'll yeah. go a long way. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks so much. Please feel free, everybody, to reach out with any questions. And I look forward to maybe meeting some of you later this summer. Yeah. Very good. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Okay. okay. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. Thank you.